Welcome to Christ Central Church, virtual worship for Sunday. Glad to have all of you with us today. Let's start out by singing together 10,000 Reasons. Bless the Lord.
And I have a maker He formed my heart And before even time began My life was in His hand He knows my name favorite theologians who has gone home to be with the Lord now. His name was George Buttrick. He wrote several books and one of his books is entitled, So We Believe, So We Pray. And in there, what he suggests is, one of the things that he suggests is, Jesus is best known for two primary things. First, he's best known for the cross, for his cross. For you can never, he says, separate an individual from their work. And anytime you look at the cross, be it on a church, be it on the back of somebody's car window, be it anywhere, you cannot separate Jesus from the work that he completed on the cross. The other thing that Buttrick suggests that Jesus is best known for is a prayer. Many of you, if you've got a background around the church, you'll have heard the prayer, but perhaps you don't. And perhaps today will be the first time you, you encounter the, the prayer that Jesus is, by many uh, standards, is best known for. We refer to it as the Lord's Prayer, and it sounds something uh, like this. It starts off by saying, Our Father, Jesus taught us this prayer, Our Father, who is in heaven, holy is your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Jesus is probably best known for that, that particular prayer. And you can find that uh, in Matthew's Gospel in the first book of the New Testament. You can find that uh, in chapter 6. And it's also in Luke's Gospel here in chapter 11. And we'll pick that up today because it should be then, if Jesus is best known, perhaps best known for a prayer, it should be no shock then to discover that we find Jesus praying in a certain place. Now in the ancient language, this certain place, which is a, um, the author here, Luke's kind of uh, writing style. It's no shock to find Jesus in a certain place. And, and Luke uses that term a lot to kind of highlight for us this 
um, separates some of the things that Jesus does. So what he's suggesting is, is that Jesus didn't, uh, he wasn't, at least in this place, in, in and amongst a group of people praying. He was off, pulled away, perhaps by himself in a certain place. And then when he stopped, when Jesus stopped praying, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray just as John taught his disciples. Now let's unpack that one for just a second. I think it's a fantastic thing that, 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 that his, Jesus' spiritual community, his 8 to 15, if we, as we've been talking about it over the last few weeks, that some of Jesus' 8 to 15 wanted to know how to pray. And so they figure that the best thing to do, they see Jesus on a regular basis, it appears. They've been watching him, right? So when Jesus stopped, it appears they want to learn from Jesus. And proximity has a way of doing that, doesn't it? When you, when you spend a, an inordinate amount of time around somebody, you either do one of two things. You decide that they're not worth um, in learning anything from, or you get curious about the habits and attitudes, the routines that you see going on in their life, and you want to find out more about it. Well, that appears to be what his spiritual community, Jesus is 8 to 15, that appears to be what they're asking. And, and before we go much further today, you have to really decide, and this is for everybody watching, for me, for anybody who, whether you have a background with Christianity, whether you've been a Christian for a lot of years, whether you're brand new to the faith, or whether you're still kind of thinking it through, or whether honestly you just think it's a load of, you know, whatever, you always have to decide whether or not, whether or not you want Jesus to teach you certain pieces of spirituality. And Jesus' spiritual community has seen just enough out of Jesus to, to decide that, that they need to know a little bit more about the routines in Jesus' life. And they've decided to reach out and ask him, Jesus, can you teach us a little bit more about this thing you do called prayer? And now, it might not be that uh, Jesus, in fact, here in the text, it's not that Jesus is the only one who prays, just as John taught his disciples. Now, from last week, if you tuned in, you, you may say, you said nobody, nobody were related to him was, was on the team, and this John is not the John that's on Jesus' team. This John is actually a John that is related to Jesus. Sometimes he's referred to in the New Testament as John the Baptist. In fact, this John is the one who baptized Jesus before he went immediately into his time, Jesus' time of social isolation. And one of Jesus' disciples actually was a follower of Jesus' cousin, John. Jesus' mother and John's mother were sisters. And so he, I think, is asking on behalf of all Jesus' spiritual community, on behalf of me and you, the whole world, I think he's asking for us, hey, we've seen other people pray, but Jesus, how about teaching us to pray? And so today we're going to uh, pack, unpack some of that um, to, to kind of figure out what it is that Jesus taught, if he's best known for prayer, what it is that Jesus might have taught his disciples about prayer. And so then he goes on, Jesus, so he said to them, I guess presuming the whole group, when you pray, right? And what a time word here before we move on. When you pray, it assumes an occasion that all of us have in our lives. And, and again, it has to be something that we want to be taught by Jesus about prayer today. So when you pray, Jesus says, and rather than start on the do's, we're going to start with the do not do's, and we're going to jump over to the book of Matthew. So Jesus teaches his disciples when you pray, when you decide that it's time to, to commune with, with God, to, to pray, or however you define prayer, when you do that, Jesus says, do not Right? Categorical prohibition. These are denials. Don't pick this habit up. Do not be like the hypocrites. Now, if you are new to the faith or you're exploring the faith, you see the word hypocrite and it comes out of Jesus's mouth. You maybe want to perk up just a little bit. And what Jesus is kind of alerting us to is, is that all of us kind of have this, these tendencies, these integrity gaps in our lives. When I use the word integrity gap, I'm using it in this way. I mean that I do, you do, we all have these places where we say one thing, but our behavior does and points us in another direction. Jesus is saying that when you pray, don't be like hypocrites because anytime Jesus has because or so that in a phrase, pay attention, because they love to pray while standing in the, now 
It doesn't say church in the original language. It actually says synagogue, but I've changed that one because it doesn't make any, any sense to most of us. We don't understand the synagogue concept. So they love to pray while standing in church and on the street corners so that people can see them. So in other words, Jesus says that when you pray, do not be like people who love to pray for the sake of being seen by others. Now, all of us, if we're to be honest, and maybe I'm just, this is pastoral confession, so you can be my pastor for a minute. I guess if I'm honest, there's always this part in me someplace that wants to be um, seen and, 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 and thought well of with other people. And I hope that plague doesn't, doesn't um, rule in your life. But what Jesus says is that when we are praying, the, the point is not to, not to do it in public just so other people can see it. And that's so other people will think, wow, those are super spiritual people. Or, wow, man, I wish I had those words. Or, wow, that's, that was really touching. Like, that's not the point, Jesus says, of when you pray, what other people think shouldn't even be on our mind about it. Because truly, when, when what other people think is on our mind about prayer, truly, Jesus says, I say to you, they have their reward. In other words, when, when the goal is to impress the people who hear the, the, the flowing, flowery prayers, the, the ones that are full of a lot of words, then, then that, that's all we get. And so when we pray, it's, it's a do not do so in public for the sake of being seen. All right, well, that's a good tip, Jesus, because, and, and Jesus was, he was smoking what he was selling, right? Like he was in a certain place. He was off by himself in doing that. So, all right, Jesus has integrity. He has no integrity gaps. So look at what else he says too. He says, also, when you pray, do not babble repetitiously like the Gentiles. Again, there's that word, because they think that by their many words, they'll be heard. Now, I struggle with this one, not necessarily in prayer, but in life, generally speaking, because um, if you're somebody like me, and it's probably, it's a shortcoming on my part, if you're somebody like me, more words, if, you, if you're an external processor, more words help you know what you're thinking sometimes. And sometimes when you start to pray, I don't even have words, man. Like I just have to kind of get it out and, and, and it becomes a lot of words. So when I see this one, I'm like, uh oh, <laughs> Jesus doesn't want me to be like, well, the Gentiles. And we need to unpack that one in contemporary United States culture because uh, from Jesus's time, a, a correlation, Gentile would, would be somebody who was more of a Greek descent or, or perhaps um, just not Jewish descent. And uh, they might have the tendency to be overeducated, be a trend toward philosophical trend toward the wordy sorts, right? And so what Jesus is, apparently he's made the observation is they have lots of flowery and flowing words and, and they think that because the more words simply multiplies meaning and multiplies the effect. Well, don't be like that, he says, for your father knows what you need before you ask it. Isn't that really true for those of you who are parents? Like, isn't it oftentimes, particularly um, or at least my mom and my mother-in-law are this way. They, they have this, this innate ability to kind of know what, know what I need to um, talk about before I actually say it to either of them. And, and so isn't that a great way to think that God, like God just, he just knows. And, and sometimes, um, even though I may need a whole bunch of words to when I pray to get it out and get it open uh, into the public, um, so I can even know what I think or what I feel. Um, God knows that, that no matter how many words I use in my prayer, He knows what I need. And I don't, have to, I don't have to keep going on and on and on sometimes. Sometimes, in fact, I don't even need words. Sometimes my, my heart can just cry out to God and there can be no words that pass my lips. And God knows what I need before I even ask. So maybe that's a relief. But what Jesus says, when you and I, when we want to we wanna learn how to pray from him, and there's a reason for that, do not go on and on and on and on and on just to be heard because God hears you. But, so here you go, there's two do nots, right? Because that's usually helpful. Jesus, he moves us back a little bit further in, in the book of Matthew, chapter six, this is. But when you pray, right? So that's where we started from Luke. When you pray, 
go to your room, close the door, and pray to God the Father in secret. Really? So when you pray, it's, it's not this public display of, of spirituality, Jesus is suggesting, because remember, we stumbled across him today while Jesus was in a certain place, apparently alone, away from the other his spiritual community. So Jesus says that when you and I pray, we're to go into our room. That's not God sending us to our room now, by the way, but to close the door and pray to God, to our Father in secret. In other words, like to, to, to get alone by ourselves, to commune, to fellowship, to voice and vet, as we said a few weeks ago, our, our feelings, our emotions, our thoughts, our desires, our concerns, our needs, to, to get away to isolate ourselves, to be alone in prayer with God and pray to the Father in secret, to be alone. And the Father who sees in secret will reward you there. Now, I'll be honest with you, a lot of times my, my um, secret place here isn't so secret. Like a lot of days, my, my prayer time connecting with God is, um, again, this, I hope this is helpful for you. A lot of mornings, it begins around a little bar table that we have in our kitchen. Right? I have the coffee pot on. I have my little book out that I'm, uh, that I'm following along in. I journal down from time to time several thoughts and feelings. I uh, have a calendar beside me, have my scripture out that I read. So there's lots of ways that my secret place is, is by myself. But it's certainly not hived off away from, from my family. They just normally are still asleep when I start. But, two, I do have a, a literal, some people are familiar with this verse as go into your prayer closet. Um, it's not in this translation, the New English translation. But I do have here in the church a literal closet that I have a little place that has some candles, a little um, for lack of a better word to use, a little altar place that I have in there, a chair. And, and it's in a literal closet cleaned out here at the church. And occasionally when I come in, I'll go in into there if I haven't had a, an opportunity to start my, my prayer time off to be alone with God at the kitchen table. I'll come in and go into that closet and start my candles going and close the door and, and I'm literally away from in secret in that little closet, but it's not so secret now. The point is, is that Jesus suggests that for you and I, when we begin to pray to connect with God with, with, through the power of the Holy Spirit, that it's done in secret. It's done off by ourselves. And, and I only point this out today because, again, we're living in a time where being alone, being disconnected, is, is starting to wreak havoc on our lives. But it could be. It could be that something good comes from our time alone, away from our routines, because it could help us develop a new routine of going into our room to close the door and pray to God the Father in secret, which is why we're doing that today. So when you pray, Jesus says, have your own special place, man. And, and this is a pro tip. It probably is not helpful to, to try that in the car, right? Because if, if um, it, it's not a very secret place, uh, it, doing that in the car if you're going to work, because, you know, there's other people on the road and they have a tendency not maybe to recognize uh, that you're praying to God instead of testifying behind the wheel when they cut you off in traffic. So, but what do you really do when you go in there to pray? I mean, I get it that it's in secret, right? It's what Jesus says. And so here, I want to jump over to another fellow who can, who can really help us. He was a fantastic imitator of Jesus. In fact, he was the most prolific church planter and probably um, regular day-over-day -day disciple maker of, of Jesus of anybody in the Bible. His name was Paul, and he wrote several letters. In fact, he's the most, uh, he writes the most of the New Testament in the latter part of the New Testament. He wrote a, a letter to some folks at Thessalonica, the Thessalonians here, if you will. And Paul can help us on, on when we pray. Jesus says we're supposed to do that in secret. But what are you, like, what are the mechanics? How does, it, how does it work while it's in there? And here's some parts and pieces that you and I, when we pray, that ought to be perhaps present in our prayer, in our voicing and vetting, in our sharing with God. Always rejoice in prayer. Right, right now, um, that's a, sometimes for, for, for most of us, because we've, we've been away from our routine, sometimes 
always rejoicing, particularly in prayer, is a hard thing. But Paul suggests to the Thessalonians, and it's a good, good suggestion to us, to always in prayer, always rejoice. He also suggested that they stay constantly in prayer. So that you and I, even good suggestion for us now, that you and I are to, to constantly be in a, in a state of connection with God. So you can't always stay in secret throughout the course of your day, but you can make it a regular routine to connect with God in your secret place and to continue to have focus throughout the day on communicating with God constantly being in prayer, constantly before um, you send that email that perhaps has got a, uh, a little bit of a critical tone, perhaps constantly in prayer, that email gets, some of it gets walked back. Perhaps before um, you, you say something on social media, um, constantly in prayer, maybe walks that back a little bit and, and helps us to know that maybe you and I don't see everything that, that's going on. So Always rejoicing when we're in, in prayer with God in our secret place. Constantly in a state of being connected with God. Constantly being in prayer. And in everything giving thanks. So when you and I go into our secret place because we're not out in public doing it anywhere. Where this is like you, mano y mano. You, God, me, God, us individually in our spiritual development. In time with God, we're always giving thanks. We're giving thanks for the great things that God's doing. We're giving thanks for the things that we see. We're giving thanks for the things that we don't see. We're giving thanks for the hardships of, like literally right now, we're giving thanks to God for the difficulty of being in social isolation. Why? Because it gives us an opportunity perhaps to reflect, to reflect on where we are in our own individual discipleship, our own individual, um, how we're being conformed to the, to the image of Christ, it gives us an opportunity because we're away from all those, the busyness of our life that oftentimes distracts us. And so we're giving thanks even in isolation because it gives us a place to reflect, to probe deeper and to discover the next place perhaps that Jesus is taking us to so that when we can emerge from social isolation, we can emerge to change person like Jesus did because our mind's been changed about where we are relative to where God would have us. So in prayer, we're also giving thanks for even the difficult things, right? For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Now, I would prefer Paul to have written here that, that God's will for me in Christ Jesus is that I never hurt or that I never suffer or that never that God's will for me in Christ Jesus that nobody was ever mad at me or I never had to make a hard decision or or I never had to I, you know I would you fill in the blank I would prefer that God's will for me would have been that my 401k hadn't been you know I don't have to work three more years right now because of all this stuff that's gone on like I would prefer God's will to have been something other than sometimes what it appears to be. But Paul suggests to us that in prayer, right, in our life as followers, lovers of Jesus, that we're to always rejoice, constantly be in prayer, and in everything we're to give thanks. That's the will of God for us in our lives. And so here's another part of, the, of, of being in our secret place and engaging with God in our prayer life is that do not extinguish the spirit. Now, again, if you're new to newer to the faith, when we see that when you talk about the, the spirit, we're talking about God, the Holy Spirit, who who comes to live and rule and reign in our lives when we say yes to Jesus and we um, acknowledge that it is his death and resurrection that paid for our sins. And the Holy Spirit comes and, and lives in us and continues to conform us if we'll allow, if we'll work with, if we'll always rejoice, constantly be in prayer and in everything giving thanks, cooperate with the will of God. He will conform us to the, to the image of Christ for not our own sake, because we don't ask the question what's in it for us, but for the sake of others and for what we can do to help others come along. And so when we see do not extinguish the spirit, it's, it's an acknowledgement that, that in prayer, the Holy Spirit works on us, man. 
is that it's the Holy Spirit that in Hebrews, I believe it is, that says sometimes that, that when we don't even have the words, that the Holy Spirit utters words to, to Jesus who sits at the right hand of God the Father, even when we can't put words on it. And that's good because Jesus said, don't babble on and on and on with extraneous extra words there. Sometimes we don't have words and it's the Holy Spirit that, that puts our thoughts, our feelings, our emotions, the things that we the things that we long to get up and get out before God, sometimes the Holy Spirit puts that, has to put that into words and gives it to Jesus, who then in turn takes those words and, and corrects them, right? So you don't even have to get your prayers right. Is that Jesus puts them in the right order. And then this is the beautiful thing about Jesus, is that he leans over and he whispers it into the, into the ear of God. And so that's why we don't we don't extinguish the spirit of God, because like it's the spirit of God that guides our prayers, that guides our heart, that guides our life. And in prayer, we work to work to open ourselves up to more of the Holy Spirit, and not to extinguish the Holy Spirit's work in our life. And this one, this one's another part of of prayer in our secret place. Do not treat prophecies like or with contempt. I'm going to, there's a couple ways you could filter prophecies, but I'm going to say it this way, is that when you're in prayer, when, when like the best way to continue in prayer is for God to speak to you in prayer. And when God speaks to you, prophecies, when God uh, utters a word to, to you or to me, the best way is to, to pay attention to it and not have contempt for it. Because there's a lot of times, if I'm be honest with you, again, this is, I get, this is pastoral confession day uh, for me and maybe for you too. But there's a lot of times where, where um, I ask God, for, ask God to, for a particular word, a particular direction. And, and then when I get it, he answers my prayer. I don't do it. And in fact, maybe that's why some, some, of, um, some of my prayer life, some of your prayer life is, is, is stuck and it's not very meaningful is because we, we want a word from the word, but then we go wayward again. We, we, we treat the word that God speaks into our heart through the power of the Holy Spirit, right? And that should be evidence, not that, that it scares us sometimes what God asks us, but it's evidence that we haven't extinguished the Holy Spirit. And that when God utters a word into our life, that we don't treat it with contempt in prayer. We listen, 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 and then figure out, how it is that God wants us to move forward. So, so in that, we're listening for a word from God in our secret place. It's part of prayer. But examining all things and holding fast to what is good. If you don't catch another word that I say today, I, I hope you'll catch this piece here is that um, at Lamentations chapter three, it's an Old Testament book. It's kind of a small book, but in there it says, let us examine our ways and test them and let us return to the Lord. And so when you and I are in our secret place in prayer, this is what Paul's suggesting is we examine all things. We examine our motives. We examine what we, what we hope to have happened. We examine what we think we deserve. We examine what we said, what we shouldn't say, what we left done, what we've undone. Like we examine all things. We expose our whole life to God and the power of the Holy Spirit. We examine all our ways. We examine those, those, um, those verbal darts that, that sometimes, I don't know, I have this thing that happens to me, maybe not you, these, these, these words just jump out of my mouth and it hurts, it's hurtful, and, and then I gotta go run them back down, right? We examine in prayer those kind of tendencies in our lives and, and we test them to see if they're of God or not. And we hold fast to what is good because, you know, the reality is, is that, that there's, there's a part by the grace of God. There's, there's good things in, in all of us. And no matter where we are in our spiritual journey, if you haven't even started a spiritual journey, like if you never, if you look at Jesus and go, that's, that's complete magic, like that's hokey, that's a joke. Even though, even though you don't see anything about Jesus, maybe as even being spiritual, Every time that you do something, God, we as Christians uh, do something good. We as Christians, we hold to, that's evidence, not of our, not of your, not of my inherent goodness. We're not good on our own. It's evidence that the Spirit of God has not been completely extinguished in you and that it's God pulling and moving and trying to get you to a place of having conversation with Him. 
and that all of us have good things in our lives. Not every one of our ways needs to be jettisoned, needs to be thrown away, needs to not all of our routines to stick with the line of our messages. Not all of our routines are bad routines. Hold fast to those routines that are good. Right? And in prayer, it is only opening ourselves up to the Holy Spirit. Can we discern? Can we hear from God the good places that He's working in us and the things that He wants to amplify and magnify in our lives and those other places where we've yet to surrender to God's will and that we need to allow God to do some work on us. God needs to do some surgery, right? He needs to take a scalpel to parts of to our lives still and will always be places that he continues to want to. And in prayer, we can examine all those things. And then lastly, that in prayer, we beg God. We voice and vet this final concern. That in prayer, we, we ask God to stay away from every form of evil. And sometimes, man, those forms of evil are subtle, aren't they? Those forms of evil have me um, judging motives of other people without any information whatsoever. And in fact, in my mind, sometimes I get to a place that, um, that I'm convinced someone, it's a conspiracy theory. And before I ever have prayed through and slowed down and been rejoiceful and, and, and everything given thanks for an individual's life, before I've ever been curious I've been condemning. And it's real easy for us to, to get pulled into the evil forms that exist and subtle ones at that. And so it's in a, it's in a healthy, in a secret, in a well-developed or a developing routine of prayer that we can learn to and we can entreat, we can beg God to fill us with more of the Holy Spirit so that we're able to avoid those, those destructive forms of evil in our life, even those sometimes that, quite frankly, don't even look all that bad at times. And so here's, here's how it all relates to what we've done in the power routine. We'll wind our time up here, right? We started off by saying that it should be no shock that we found Jesus in prayer because he's best known for prayer. And we've parked on this particular verse from Luke chapter 6 for several weeks now. Now, when Jesus emerged from social isolation. You'll remember that now. When Jesus, during this time, emerged from isolation, it was that he went out to the mountain. Again, Jesus went to his secret place. Just like we talk, a certain place from Luke, the secret place. He went out and he shut the door. Um, he went out there to pray alone. And he spent all night. Now, I underline this one because in the ancient language, you can't see this. The only time in the entirety of Scripture this word is used to, to suggest like Jesus spent the whole time focused in prayer on what it was he needed to do in prayer to God all night long, right? Sometimes I have some difficulty in my secret place staying focused, but over time and developing a good routine, Jesus will help us with that. But he spent all night in prayer. And then when he emerged from his prayer time, right? He goes back and he chooses 12 of them. From all his relationship connections, he chooses from his prayer time, his 8 to 15. He, 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 he's high, I think in his prayer time, he's highlighted for him by the power of the Holy Spirit. He's highlighted um, in his mind, in his heart, those 8 to 15 people that God had supernaturally and strategically put into his life because he was trying to bring them along. And he was asking Jesus to bring them along to help him grow in a relationship with God. And so that's how it relates for us. This is why we're talking about prayer today is, is by looking at Jesus's life and, and seeing that Jesus didn't do too much without a spirit of prayer. He certainly spent all night in prayer before he chose his spiritual community to surround himself with, to sow his life into, to be changed by them and to change them, to work with other people, being on mission with each other, the mission of God in the world. And so out of all, the, all that that's there, I want to um, leave you with basically the bottom line today, and here it is, right? Is that Jesus chose his 8 to 15 by the power of his prayer routine. And then he taught the power of this routine to his 8 to 15. Remember how we started. Lord, teach us to pray. 
Right? They recognized that there was something in the power of Jesus' routine that they didn't know anything about and that they didn't want to stay on the outside anymore. And they had the, they had the desire, the motivation, the want to, to ask Jesus, Lord, teach us how to pray. And Jesus had already chosen his 8 to 15 by that same prayer, prayer power in his life, the power, power of his prayer routine. And then he turns around and he teaches that same power of his routine, his prayer routine, to his 8 to 15. Why? Because when Jesus emerged from a time of isolation, he emerged a changed man because he had a changed mind. And his mind change went from when he went in, what's in this for me? To choosing a spiritual community. And his mindset was, what can I do to help? And it appears at least today that what he could do to help was teach his 8 to 15, the power of his prayer routine. Friends, perhaps that's the thing, the next step for you, the next step for me, is before we begin to surround ourselves with our spiritual community, is to spend some time in our secret place, praying to God that he would highlight for us those 8 to 15 people that he supernaturally and strategically put into our life, that he wants to try to reach, that he's trying to move along just a little bit closer to begin a relationship with, to deepen a relationship, to transform a life. And then to go out and to invite them to join with you as you join with Jesus and together you transform the world because you have a changed mind you have a new routine. I'll see you next week. I, the Lord of sea and sky, I have heard my people cry, all who dwell in dark and sin, I hand will save. I who made the stars of night, I will make the darkness bright. Who will bear my light to them? Shall I say, Here I am, Lord? Is it I, Lord? I have heard you calling in the night. I will go. Oh, oh, oh.